Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Chris Sevigny and Jamie Bateman on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes. And that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Jamie Bateman, flying solo as a host today. However, I am joined by a special guest. Today, we have Gary Wilson of Real Estate with Gary Wilson. Gary, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Great. Thanks for asking, Jamie. Absolutely. So I had the pleasure and honor of being on your show a few months ago, which is how we got connected. And that was really fun. So I do recommend that our listeners go back and listen to that and listen to the rest of your shows as well. There are many different rabbit holes we could go down today because you've got a ton of experience with real estate investing and you know realtors and books and lots of things we could talk about. So if you don't mind for the listeners, can you dive into your background a little bit? For us. Sure. Well, uh, it's it's interesting. You know, sometimes in life you you plan and prepare and do all the the typical conventional things and and you you know follow a path and things work out. But but I think probably half the time or better, it, they're, they're just you know crazy accidental events and, and introductions that really cause big turns in your life. And that's what happened to me. I went to college to study computer science, which I actually did do. And I, but I did manage to graduate in spite of all the beer. <laughs> but, uh, but in the summer orientation before freshman year, we were all called down to go and, and take placement exams to see where we're short off what they call the core classes, you know, English, math, and all that kind of stuff they still do. And lo and behold, I meet this guy named Socrates. We, we were paying fast friends. It was like blood brothers from the moment we met. And we were headed back to the student union building and figured we'd see each other when the semester started. And lo and behold, our parents were sitting there talking to each other. We're like, well, this is pretty prophetic. And one of the, the dads said, his dad said, why don't you guys be roommates, you know? And uh, we called the whatever that department is in the college. They said, yeah, we'll let you be roommates. And they, I don't, we never found out who our other roommates would have been. We never met them. Hmm. But it turns out Sock's dad was a big investor in Richmond, Virginia. He was a Greek immigrant. His, his mom went to Greece for high school graduation. Her family is also Greek, but second generation, they wanted to send her back to meet the family. And she came back three months later, married to Miss, we call him Jim Demet. He shortened his name and Americanized his name. Turns out he's a big investor. And when we graduated, we were like, you know, typical go out, we're going to go rent something. And his dad said, oh, no, you're not. You're not going to rent anything you're going to buy. So we decided, okay, we'll buy. And we were going to, we made an offer on this great two bedroom townhome a block away from the ocean and we called his dad we were, we're so proud and he said he was yelling he said you guys are idiots he said get out of that deal right now and he said i'm going to come down and he said you're going to buy a property that you're going to make money on and we're like okay you got our attention now so we did bought a four bedroom two bathroom house we house hacked it we rented out the other two bedrooms to two other guys who paid our rent and this was in january 1986 interest rates were still through the roof so we assumed the owner's first mortgage. It was a VA mortgage. He was in the Navy. He had a second mortgage that we refinanced with our own second that his dad, Sox dad, co-signed for. And then the remaining equity, we gave him a note for a third, a third position. And that's how we did it. Um, okay. Two years so, later, I, yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, uh, so, but you couldn't have done that because house hacking, Brandon Turner started house hacking. He was the first one to ever do it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, but <laughs> he uh, coined the term, I guess. You know, Brandon and I are in the same mastermind group called Go Abundance, and he actually endorsed my seventh, my last book, which is my seventh book. Okay. Because I talked about this whole thing about creative purchasing techniques and how it has its place. It's just not every place. And my what I try to get people to do is to get on a cash basis as soon as possible. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, the reality is you will get much better deals using cash. And later on, you can finance from a so position. I'm curious right. about that. And we'll get you know more toward uh, kind of yeah. where your portfolio and your businesses look right now. But yeah. you mentioned that, I think, on that the episode I was on as far as being on a cash basis. And do you mind just quickly drilling down on that? What, what does that mean exactly? You know, I, I understand, obviously, buying a property for cash without using a loan. What does operating on a cash basis mean exactly? 
Yeah, exactly. Really what it is, it's, it's a shift from leading with a loan, leading into the transaction with a loan to leading with cash. Okay. It gives you a much stronger negotiating position. And I mean, you actually your own cash. I don't mean, you know, people sometimes will cheat and they'll say, they'll call and say, hey, well, I'm, I'm going to make a cash offer. Mm-hmm. And then you go digging, you find out they don't have cash. They're getting mm-hmm. a loan from some other private party. That's mm-hmm. not cash. That That's leading with a loan. Mm-hmm. And it, it'll... Number one, it's it's you know you don't want to say something that's not completely accurate. You want to be sure. authentic and genuine because your reputation is everything. So so back to the technique though. Yeah. What I did is I did in the beginning I bought my first couple of properties with twenty percent down. So I did start with some cash, not all cash, and I, I was just a very disciplined person. I started saving from day one, played the the mutual fund market, did well with that, and so when I got into real estate, I realized okay, I can borrow private money for maybe 10%, get hard money for 15%, or I can get a really cool bank loan for like 7%, okay? And which is less expensive, obviously, than 10 or 15. Mm-hmm. Fewer points, and uh, yes, they, they go against your credit and all that, but you know what, that's part of the game. So I decided, well, I'm gonna play that route. And I start, it turns out I start off with an equity position and a stronger cash flow position, because if you start off with some cash, at least you have some equity, right? And if you do that, you also have a lower principal balance, which means you have lower mortgage payments. So you have better cash flow position. Mm-hmm. And what it did is it may look like it was slow in the beginning. And maybe by some people's standards, it was slow. But I did buy 10 buildings that first year. Mm-hmm. Um, I was 35 years old and it was duplexes, fourplexes, threeplexes. It was actually worked out to be 30 units by the end of the first year. And I was making enough in cash flow that met or equaled my corporate bank salary. I was a corporate banker doing mergers and acquisitions. I was doing pretty good. They kept promoting me. I was up in, uh, you know, you know, you know, upper level management working directly for the executives. That was not fun. I mean, literally, I had a cot in my office. That's how bad it was. I stayed working two, three, four in the morning, go home, see my kids in the morning, sleep a couple hours, go back. And they kept promoting me because I kept doing it. And I thought, well, this was a big trap and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I started mm-hmm. investing and I used my cash to start off. And then quickly I had a collectively equity across all these properties, plus equity in my own home, right? And I still had the 401k and all that. So I was looking pretty good. I'm mm-hmm. thinking, boy, I'll just stop right here. But I'm an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs don't ever stop, right? <laughs> right. So here's the here's what I did, guys. And I want you to everybody write this down. I was able to secure a business line of credit. It's called a commercial line of credit in a second position against the equity in those first 10 properties. That's exactly what I did. And to this day, people will tell me, well, you can't do that because the commercial lenders want to be in the first position. Of course they do. But they're also business people. And if they see a good deal, right, and you have good terms, they'll they'll do the deal. So I found a a private commercial lender who Hmm. did the deal extracted $107,000, went out and bought the next property Hmm. for cash. Note investing is an exciting space, but when you think of servicing your loans, you may automatically feel a sense of overwhelm and frustration. BiFi Loan Servicing is here to change that. BiFi is a servicing company founded by investors for investors and managed by servicing veteran Shante Duffy. To learn more, visit BiFiLS.com. Again, that's B-I-F-I-L-S dot com. I hadn't heard that one. So yeah. the properties were all still collateral for this line of credit. That was a business yeah. line of credit. I'm imagining it was also a recourse loan where it's still you're personally liable, like you alluded to Correct. earlier. But that gives you a lot of flexibility for when a deal arises, right? And then you can go and purchase the deal. That's pretty neat. Not a lot of people are doing that these days, I don't think. No, well, a lot of people hear, unfortunately, that, well, you can't do that because commercial lenders want to refinance everything to be in a first position. Mm-hmm. And I agree that most of them do, and most of them will not budge on that. But you keep digging and asking and finding. And surely, you know, there's the old, old saying, ask and you shall receive. Well, I kept asking. And <laughs> on a commercial lender, a licensed commercial lender who mm-hmm. did, did the deal with private money. And so I wasn't paying hard money, wasn't mm-hmm. paying a lot of points. And what's really cool about it is this. After a year, it was a nine unit building. I fixed it up, raised the rent, so it was much worth much more. I went out and got a brand new loan on that, on that building. And remember now that loan is in first position, right? Mm-hmm. Because I used collectively equity from other properties through a line of credit that did not create a lien on the property. 
So when I got a brand new first mortgage on it, it was way more than I needed to pay back the line of credit. So I paid back the line of credit, hmm. put cash in my pocket, still had plenty of cash flow. And by the way, what do you think that lender did for me on that line of credit when I just added another income producing asset to my bottom line and paid off the line of credit? What do you think his next move was? I would guess they bumped up the limit. He raised the limit. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody listening, I'm telling you, that was the tipping point for me. And that eventually led to me purchasing a 90 unit building within a few short years. And, you know, the rest of the is history did the same thing. We were able, when you work with the right kind of banks and you have a, a track record, it actually gets easier. So when everybody to really just let that sink into you, it may look hard in the beginning and maybe it is. And everybody, we all start with different uh, hand of cards, right? But the point is, is, be diligent, be persistent, be consistent, and don't ever take any money out. Just keep putting it back in, right? And what I mean by that, I was giving an example is on the other properties I had, what I started doing was taking the excess cash flow and started paying down and paying off those older, smaller mortgages, which okay. gave me stronger equity positions and no liens on this property. It became easier. So, so think people have heard of the bird method, right? Buy. Yeah model rent refinance essentially was doing that but i kept doing it on a bigger scale and using my technique of leading with cash to get the better deals and then replenish when i was ready to go for the next property what does it look like for you today i know you got a lot of things going on i know you're yeah. a busy guy you're still a very hard working guy what does your portfolio look like what do your businesses sure. look like today well i'll tell you exactly what i'm doing you know being that i'm an old banker in IT, as you can imagine, I'm a numbers guy. So I do a lot of research. I love to learn. In fact, in my corporate days, instead of going out to lunch, Jamie, what I did is I brought a brown bag lunch, went up to the corporate library and studied for the entire hour, every single day, Monday through Friday. I learned all I could about the markets, the business, trading, everything. So I took those skills and applied it to real estate. So here's what's happening right now. Obviously, we're at or near the top of this market. Everybody agrees is you know the inflation yeah, i know that the news is telling you it's 5.4 percent but watch what they call the bread basket they came out with that back in the 70s bread basket is the typical basket of goods that you and i buy you know milk bread eggs mm -hmm. uh, gasoline you know toiletries whatever mm -hmm. well what the government does is they manipulate the basket of goods they'll take out the things that have high inflation and, and replace it with things that have low inflation so they artificially say it's 5.4%. But mm -hmm. everybody that's been grocery shopping in the last couple of weeks or has bought gas knows it is not 5.4%. <laughs> I right. mean, a roast, we just bought a roast for $36. Okay. That's ridiculous. So, wow. <laughs> so in any case, um, yeah, people who are really in the game understand that inflation is real and er inflation will kill any economy given enough time. And that's what that's going to happen. It's a mathematical certainty. It's nothing to be afraid about. Is mm -hmm. something to prepare for. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now having said that, leading up to this, obviously it's been a great run up and we've had a, a 10 year run in this recovery easily. Mm -hmm. Best we've ever seen. Strongest before the pandemic, all indicators, Forbes, Fortune, Money, Barron's, all of them touting the, the economy is the strongest economy they've ever seen in recorded history by all measures, right? Unemployment across all demographics, everything was as best as it could be. Well, what that leads to is increased prices, right? And this, this mm -hmm. shows that real estate big time. Now, the rents have not kept pace. Rents have definitely been going up a lot, mm -hmm. but not at the same pace as the values. So the traditional rental market where you buy a, a building or a house, whatever, rent it out to families and young couples for a year, and you still need that market. It's just not as profitable as it was 10 years ago, right? Not even five years ago. So what we're doing is we're leading more into Airbnb. Been around for 12 years now. It's now it's public, right? That they offered their mm -hmm. stock back in the spring. It's now considered a mature sector in the industry. It ain't going anywhere. I don't care what the neighbors say, what the hotel <laughs> this um, mm -hmm. lobbyists say. It's here to yeah. stay. Consumers want it. It's here to stay. There's other other sectors like the corporate housing sector. Mm -hmm. Corporate housing is short term housing, not. It's yeah. between 30 days and a year. So it's traveling nurses, it's traveling executives, traveling contractors that get six yeah. month jobs. So their companies or they will pay sometimes twice or more the prevailing rental rates because they get a furnished place. They don't have to pay utilities. And the thing we like as landlords is 
they show up by themselves. They're not coming in there with, with children and dogs where there's going to be a lot of heavy wear and mm-hmm. this. They're coming and they're going to work during the day. They come in and sleep at night and you collect all your rent. You don't have all these court cases. It's way easier. And it's mm-hmm. one of the fastest growing sectors. So I'm letting mm-hmm. the cat out of the bag here. As you might imagine, in the last year and a half, would you agree traveling nurse sector has grown dramatically? Yes, I would think so. <laughs> it has been great demand for housing for traveling nurses. Okay. Sure. They're making a lot of money. I don't blame them. Go travel and, and get double what you get working at the hospital. <laughs> yeah, right? absolutely. So in any case, uh, so we're serving that market. And when it comes to Airbnb, we're not just buying any old place. We specifically search for properties in areas where there's a lot of activities. People always think of areas like Orlando. Orlando attracts destination travelers, vacation travelers, mm-hmm. and also business travelers. It's a great area to own properties mm-hmm. because you've always got people willing to live there. Mm-hmm. And business, a lot of business travelers, believe it or not, I'm one of them. I started using Airbnb because I was just tired of the hotel. I mm-hmm. nothing against the hotels. I love Marriott, made me a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But it's the same room over and over and over again and the same cheap breakfast over and over again. I go to an Airbnb, I get a home cooked meal, I get a private bedroom with a bathroom, a deck, a patio. So it's great business. So what we do is people will pay extra money on weekends when there's a big football game, a big baseball game, a big hockey game. Mm-hmm. ethnic celebration like festivals a concert mm-hmm. things like that mm-hmm. so we'll focus on areas that are reasonably priced and yet have all of those activities going on so sometimes the beach areas don't have those i mean yes miami has a football team and a basketball team and a baseball team absolutely mm-hmm. that would work okay but if you go to the west coast of florida like naples yeah. beautiful beaches but you don't have a football team a baseball team or a basketball team it's true yeah okay? so it's, everybody yeah. that's uh i know uh you know, a lot of people do think of Airbnb or short-term rentals as strictly vacation rentals, but that's far from the, you know, that's part of it for sure. That's part of what short-term rentals are, but absolutely. It's much bigger than that. So you all are fo- actively focused on that. It sounds like, and is there, do you have other parts to your, your portfolio still? Do you still have a lot of your rentals that you bought along the um, way? Or? Yes. And no, the, I've sold a bunch of them, sold a lot of them mm-hmm. in fact, over years ago. But I stayed involved of uh, where I provide funding and I get sometimes equity, sometimes profit share, and oftentimes mm-hmm. it's just basic uh, cash flow coming or interest, interest payments on the on mm-hmm. the debt. So which leads to another subject we'll talk about in a moment, which is notes. But yeah, but, but right now, one of the cool things we're doing is anybody paying attention to the insurance but life insurance business realizes that yes, we've had whole life for hundreds of years, hundreds of yeah. years. Universal life going back maybe two generations, you know, back to the 80s and 70s. But index universal life is, is, is I like it even better. And you do build up cash value that you can borrow against for your own investing, okay? But there's also components where you can use a conduit account inside mm-hmm. of a life insurance or associated with a life insurance policy to be able to buy a bigger policy, dump all your, ever your, your income in there, whether it's from a business or a W-2 job, Mm-hmm. And then you extract enough each month to pay your bills. The remainder stays in there, allows you to buy a bigger policy, whether for cash value faster. And the residual ends up staying there, becoming another stream of income hmm. 30 years down the road in your retirement years, right? Mm-hmm. It's just amazing. These these are not your grandfather's insurance policies. So we're getting to that, into that, even on our team. We have, we have a big production team around the country mm-hmm. called the Global Investor Agent Team. And these are real estate agents that we train to work with us investors in now 25 states. We just launched it last year. We were already in half the country. It's amazing. But they're investors too. And they learn how to identify, analyze, negotiate properties on behalf of us investors. And anybody can participate. Anybody, if, if you're ever interested, I mean, maybe mm-hmm. at the end of the, the podcast, I can give them a website or something. But yeah, we, really- we can we can put it in the show notes. Absolutely, the link to you know to all that stuff. So how does that? So if I'm a so a, you know a note investor mm-hmm. listening to this, how does that life insurance thing relate to me directly? Yeah. Good question. So just like any note, a note where you're borrowing against the cash value of a life insurance policy, just like any other note, is a commodity that can be bought and sold. You know, so you can. Like for, let's say, for example, I have a whole life insurance policy or universal life, and I borrowed against my own policy to flip a home, for example, and I might agree to pay myself 6%, okay? But I might also get to pay myself 10%, 
which is very attractive right now in the marketplace. Remember sure. that what the bank's paying right now is, is Next to close nothing. to zero. What the government pays <laughs> is exactly zero. So, so we consumers are benefiting from this. We're, if you go get a traditional mortgage, maybe three and a half percent. Commercial might be four and a quarter. Mm-hmm. But if you can produce a note that's paying 10 percent, there are a lot of people who'd be interested in potentially purchasing that note. Okay. And it's not just for you and your own your own cash value and your own properties. I mean, you could, uh, Jamie, I could loan, loan, borrow, get my cash value, give you the proceeds so that you can go flip a home and you pay me an interest rate or maybe a share of profit. There's so many ways you can structure this. It's yeah. not, it's not regulated like the banking industry is. It is regulated right. different. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 it's a whole, uh, you know, we talked right before we hit record. I do uh, kind of infinite banking myself and some some version of that. And it doesn't mean I'm the world's leading expert on it, but it, there's so many paths, mm-hmm. like you just said, there's so many ways you can go about it. And it's amazing once you get into it. Like you said, first of all, these life insurance companies have been around since most of them before yeah. the IRS was a thing. And <laughs> there are many ways, there are many commodities within this world. So, and mm-hmm. the the loans you're talking about, or, and then there's all, even the uh, life insurance policies can actually be uh, bought and sold as well, which is a whole secondary market for that. But yeah, I mean, I Chris hasn't, I haven't gotten Chris on board with this yet, but I, I use my policies to, the way I look at it personally is my note business, there, there are three, and the same thing for real estate, but there's three essential, three big buckets that, you know, mm-hmm. that every action or every activity we work on has to fit in one of these three buckets. One is raising capital or finding money, right? That could be going out. Chris and I have a a note fund where we raise capital from other investors. That's one way of raising capital. But another way that I raise capital is through these whole life policies that I use and I borrow against them to invest in my note business and then kind of arbitrage the difference. And then the other two categories are asset management and, and finding deals, which are very important as well. That's really interesting. Is there, was there an impetus there? I mean, there must've been, but yeah. Why did you kind of start really actively moving into that that space? Yeah. Well, I am, um, you know, of course, being an entrepreneur, I'm always, the radar is always open for new opportunities. So way back in the 80s, I had my first whole life policy. I, I was blessed to be able to know some some fairly affluent people in the early days. And, you know, of course, I became an investor, eventually got my license because I the realtors didn't know how to help me. So I thought, well, I'll get my license. And that led to the brokers company. That led me to other introductions to some well-known people that some of you probably would know some of their names if I mentioned them. But mm-hmm. what I recognize is all of them had whole life insurance policies, big ones. And they weren't just doing it for the death benefit. They were mm-hmm. doing it for the, partly to help retain the lifestyle of their, of their loved ones should something happen to them, right? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of these guys are business owners. And a lot of us business owners know that we are actually the business. And if something happens to us, mm-hmm. a lot of times the business will, will struggle. So the family's left with this business that now is worth less and maybe like making less money, unless they have this big giant death benefit, right? To, to maintain their, their wealth and maintain their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Well, the other benefit was cash value. Mm-hmm. And they were using the cash value to do their investing. So they were not going to the banks it made it's a lot more flexible. The loans are it's your money that you're borrowing yeah. against them, and even the, even if the life insurance company gives you the money, it's still collateralized against your your cash value. Yeah. And then they would do other cool, cool things. They would get a loan from the life insurance company that was further collateralized by a big chunk of land, for example. And then so then instead of just borrowing us the, the the cash value, they would get a loan even on a even on a life policy they just opened up the other day. They would get a loan that's 10 times what, what that value is because they have this additional collateral. But yet it's still an internally controlled loan. It's not, mm-hmm. they're not going up against the, the federal banking law for conventional mortgages. And it doesn't mess with their credit. So I started watching that. And I know people now that have 20 or more whole life policies, mm-hmm. life insurance policies. And there's yeah. other things too. There's some other benefits like that money inside of there. Well, for one thing, if somebody, if you were to receive a death benefit for, from another person's policy, they name you as beneficiary, that's non taxable. Okay. But also inside there, that growth, mm-hmm. right, of the, of the value is also non taxable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what blew my mind when I actually took the time to study this, you know, a couple of years ago. It was like, wait a minute. So essentially, a dollar is doing double duty. It's growing inside the policy, but I can also borrow against it and, and create another dollar over here. And then kind of bring it back and 
Yeah, it's a really powerful strategy. And that's I love the fact that your mind is always open to new possibilities and you're always looking for kind of ways to go about things. You don't just take no for an answer and you know, keep working your corporate job and stuff money into your 401k, which is was the 401k itself is a lot younger than these policies are as far as a uh, history goes. But that's really cool. I love the just the creativity and not taking no for an answer. And it's obviously you've done well going about it like that. So you mentioned briefly, I just want to back up for a second. So I think you said 35 was maybe when you kind of really started investing in real estate. Is that, I just wanted to touch on that because you might have people are you know in their mid thirties and they think it's, uh, I missed the boat or, you know, it's too late yeah. to, to be a real estate investor. Is it, was that what you said before? Yeah, well, actually, my, my oldest student, by the way, is 84 years old. So it's, it's, there's plenty of gas in the tank, believe me. But for me, in the beginning, what happened, so Socrates and I bought this house two years later, you know, after having fun for two years, bachelors on the beach, I, I fell in love and got married, right, and moved to Western Pennsylvania in the, in the Pittsburgh area. But I remember when we closed on that property, we went down to Mr. Demetz, one of his beach houses in the Outer Banks, and he's pounding his chest, saying, if you boys do what I tell you to do, when you're 35 years old, you won't have to work for anybody else. Well, we didn't do that. We mm-hmm. bought boats. We bought, you know, big trucks. We put everything we, <laughs> right. we set what he told us to do. Right. So I wake up 10 years later, 35, in the corporate world, getting promoted, going up through the ranks, and hitting it every second of the way. And he had passed away since then, by the way. Hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, what if I had done what he had told me, right? And I started, I said, I'm going to do it. So I went out and started investing, paid for a mentor, an early gentleman named Gud- uh, Gerhard Flugfelder. And he's, he's since passed away. He was 72 at the time, took me under his wings and showed me how to do what I did that first year when I bought those 10 properties and went and got that, that commercial line of credit. That was kind of on my own, but he made the introduction. And the next year, I bought 10 properties. Then hmm. what I did is I took a year off, paid back, paid off the secondary debt. You know, I had mm-hmm. I took out a home equity line of credit, personal line of credit, paid all that off. So they had even stronger equity and more borrowing power because I had great credit. Then went out, and then I started being more strategic and buying bigger properties, five units, nine units, things like that. By the time I was 40, I was well positioned. I had the cash flow coming in that exceeded my bank salary, which was pretty good. It was already over six figures at that time. I also had enough cash on hand to manage four different projects in different phases, you know, purchasing, remodeling, whatever. I was able to manage four projects on a cash basis. That's when I knew I was independent. And that's when I made the leap and got out of the corporate world. Thank the Lord and never looked back. It was really that first year, Jamie. It was strange because I'm literally going out on my deck in the morning with a newspaper and a cup of coffee in my bathrobe, watching my neighbors drive to work. And I felt guilty. I was, I, for that first year, it was a mental, emotional struggle because I just didn't, my programming from childhood, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, right? And my grandparents on my mother's side were basically, you know, month to month, paycheck to paycheck. And on my father's side, there were some wealth in there. But it was from the, they got through the depression era where they saved everything and put money in mattresses and suitcases. And so I had some really weird program I had to overcome. And it took me about a year and I finally realized I actually earned this. It's like I bought my own freedom, right? That's really interesting. Do you mind just diving? Uh, I know we're heading toward the end here, but diving uh, into that kind of the struggle that you face there and then the mindset shift yeah. you had to make. I mean, because because most people will kind of think, oh, you know, this glorious moment when I leave my corporate job and that's, you know, I just sit on the, the beach and drink Mai Tais or whatever. And, but I've heard this from other people as well, that yeah. it can be a little bit of a struggle. Do you mind kind of just drilling down on that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the first thing was the fear. I mean, I could have left earlier, but I, I had, you know, five weeks vacation, big giant 401k, medical, dental. I mean, I was, you know, on the way to, to the C-suite. And so when I left, I had a lot of negative feedback from family and friends like, what are you doing? Are you nuts? Are you agree? People dream for that job, you know, but I was not happy. So when I left, I had to get over and give her all that, get over all that first. But for the next year and ever since then, guys, I want to tell you, you can never learn too much. I would study and learn everything there is about how our minds work, right? The, the, the connection between our mind or our body and our spirit, study all of that because That is way more important, way more valuable than anything I can teach you academically about identifying, analyzing, and negotiating deals. That's the easy part. I can teach you how to make money in real Mm -hmm. estate. The hard part 
is will you do it and will you stick with it and will you be in a comfort zone, will you be in abundance with what you have? Mm-hmm. I was in scarcity back then. Now I'm in abundance. So I had I did have a coach for a long time, private coach named Janai Lane, wonderful person. And she helped me really see how my programming was affecting me and how to undo it and really operate from abundance. So now what happens is instead of me thinking linearly, linear is thinking, I'm going to set up a broker's company in Wichita, Kansas. Okay. That's linear thinking. That feels like big thinking to most people. Okay. Mm-hmm. But when you're in abundance mindset, you think exponentially. And what you realize is if I can do it in Wichita, Kansas, I can do it in every metropolitan area in the country. Mm-hmm. So everything we do now, we do on a national scale. We will launch it, beta test it in one location, but mm-hmm. then we quickly expand exponentially. Yeah. That's, a- no, that's great. I, we had, uh, I interviewed uh, Rod Khalif a while back. I don't know if you've talked to him before, but it, just a similar vibe as far as mindset. You know, I think he talks about mechanics being mm-hmm. 10% or 20% of, of actually executing actually getting a, a goal accomplished, but mindset is 80 to 90% of it. And just thinking bigger, that doesn't mean, like you said, you got to test it. You got to actually have, you have to know that it works and that, you know, but you you can't skip those steps necessarily. Yeah. But if you can do it once, you can do it a hundred times, a thousand times. So I love it. So then you, you were able to get past that challenge of fear and maybe guilt, it sounds like, or different negative mindset. What would you say looking back, was your biggest mistake or maybe a regret you have? Oh boy, selling some of the properties. There have been properties that really caused me a lot of headaches, but at the end of the day, I always made money, so I never really regretted buying them. But I can tell you almost every property I've sold, I regretted selling hmm. because it just, and I, I, one of my best friend's fathers told me this. When I just got out of college, I bought that house and he said, good move. You know, that Mr. Demet taking you in like that was a, was a very lucky break and he, he's right. But what he told me was says, buy as much as you can, as early as you can, because real estate is always going to go up. Yeah, we have dips, not like the stock stock market. Mm -hmm. Real estate, just like in the last recession, real estate went down. But over time, I mean, that property I paid $63,000 for in January 1986 is now worth about a half a million dollars. Okay. So you better believe I wish I'd have held on to that one and all the (laughs) other ones too. So keep your properties. You guys, if you own the property, Mm-hmm. Unless you're dying, keep the property. Okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, yeah. that's that's good. I've heard that before. Yeah. So as we head towards a final mm-hmm. section here, I know obviously this is the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast, and we we sent you a few questions before before this, and I read through your answers. And one of the questions is about a good deed that you've done through through your investing, and I'm sure there's a too many to to mention, but. Uh, I think you you had one in mind. Do you recall that? Yeah. Well, the early days, I started sponsoring families from like Bosnia, a war in Bosnia in the late 90s and brought them in, put them in my units, gave them a break on the rent and things like that. We leveraged our assets to serve the community. Later on, it was uh, people from Burma and Nepal in the mid to late 2000s that we ended up taking one entire building and turned over at the time uh, about 75% of the units to refugee families. But that led me to go back to a vision I had many years before called the Healing House Foundation. So now because of our investor network and all these investor agents we train, we were able to purchase properties in communities that have a need for housing, remodel them, but then then flip them into, into service as opposed to profit. And that, you know, we there's a whole business structure there using uh, charitable remainder trusts and so forth. Way too much for for this podcast. We can do another one if you want. Mm-hmm. It's a wonderful way to gain fulfillment from what you're doing because that was one of the key struggles with me is I wasn't being fulfilled in the early okay. days. Now when I leverage this and the more that I give, it's like the more I receive and it's just a trip. My very next call is actually with a minister, recovering addict who has a program for other recovering addicts. And we're, we're thinking of implementing that through the Healing House Foundation. So mm-hmm. everybody can participate as a giver, or everybody knows somebody who's struggling, particularly with addiction and and, mm-hmm. and more likely uh, a need for housing. Mm-hmm. You know, look me up. Go to go to real estate with Gary Wilson.com. It's easy. Real estate with Gary Wilson.com. You'll see a work with me form. You just click on it. Or here's another one is for for realtors. Just find out more. Click on that. Just leave your email. And um, I'll share information with you. You can get all kinds of free books on that site, by the way. But but we talk about the Healing House Foundation and we take meaningful steps to make it happen because at the end of the day you can't take 
your properties with you. You can't take your money with you. But you know what you can take with you is a fulfilled heart serving you. You will gain more, I promise you, by serving others. We call it prosperity through service. Serve others first and you shall prosper as a result. I wish I learned that lesson when I was in my 20s and 30s. It took me till I was in my 40s and 50s to figure that out. It's the biggest lesson I've ever learned. And you, you can't happiness, you can't measure that kind of happiness. Okay. That's phenomenal. I mean, that's it's it's hard for me to follow up with anything <laughs> uh, yeah. after all that. I mean, that's really good. It's, I mean, I love the the whole mindset of being. Obviously, you know, life is much bigger than ourselves, right? So, mm -hmm. but it's nice to it's refreshing to hear from a successful real estate investor that it's not all about the money and themselves and greed. And truthfully, I don't think that there are many successful real estate investors who really are only focused on themselves. I think they get a bad rap, but that's really refreshing to hear from you that you're, how you're able to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with profit and, and success right. and, you know, wealth and cash flow for yourself and your family. But the mm -hmm. fact that you're giving back, I mean, that clearly, clearly adds a lot of purpose to your life. It sounds like so that's, that's, that's really good. I know you have that call you just mentioned, and I know uh, you're a very busy guy. You mentioned uh, the website and uh, I've checked out your website before. There's a ton of free, valuable information yeah. there. So I do recommend all of our listeners go check that out. Is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we hop yeah, off? Just, well, I did just remember, if you go to the website and you click on members area, there's another page on the that you go to. The left side is for people who are already members. The right side is for people who want to be members. And you can become a member for free for like 30 days and grab all the books and all the resources. I mean, it's like Christmas time. Just grab it all for free. And of course, we have the podcast, Massive Cash Loop Podcast, and the YouTube channel, Real Estate yeah. with Gary Wilson YouTube channel with, I think now, 16 different playlists and I don't know how many hundreds of videos. But my, my thing is, learn learn as much as you can learn okay mm -hmm. and get all the good learning for free as much as you can and we got a ton of it so sure. so have that and treat yourself christmas is coming up give some free gifts to people there you, you know go. be you've got books yeah. on what flipping rental properties i mean pretty much every facet of, of real estate i i believe is that correct yeah. Wholesaling and commercial Wholesaling. property management. Yeah. I need to actually update it because the thing industry is changing so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean it's crazy, you know yeah, but I think that's really valuable is to educate yourself, invest in yourself. Yeah. No one knows what you, we talked about market condi market conditions earlier, inflation, and, and uh, that's obviously here. But we don't know exactly what it's going to look like in five years as far as real estate, you know, pricing or any of that. But the more you can learn, the better off you are in that position when it does, you know, when those changes do occur, and then you're you're informed and can make an informed decision. So. Yeah, Gary, this has been phenomenal. I think we should have have you back on the show if you if you would be willing sure. to join us. There's so many different paths we could go down. We've just barely scratched the surface on really any of them, and I know there's a, a lot we could go we could do here next time. So if you'd be willing, I'd, we'd love to have you back on the show. I'd be honored, and, and thank you, Jamie, for having me on. It's such a pleasure to do this. I, I, I love to teach. It's my nature. And, uh, and by the way, I got a new Hawaiian print shirt. I got a few more. We'll, we'll, I'll use another Hawaiian print shirt for another podcast. How about that? There you go. We'll look, <laughs> we look forward to that. I love it. <laughs> okay. So, all right, Gary. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And for all those listeners out there, don't forget to go out and do some good deeds. Take care, everyone. You got it. Take care. God bless everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.